Epoxy river tables have become very popular and they're pretty simple to make. Basically, you just get a natural edge board, split it down the middle, reverse the two sides, and fill the center with epoxy. I'm going to go ahead and show you every step along the way now you can make one of these for yourself. When choosing a board, you want to make sure you've got a natural edge that you could work with. Maybe look a little bit interesting. This happens to be a piece of walnut that also has a lot of sapwood in it. I think the variations will make it a little bit more unique. Uh, it's got checking down here on this end, which you're going to want to get rid of. So I want to make sure that I'm at least getting rid of that. And up on this side, you end up hitting all sapwood starting here. So I want to avoid that because that doesn't look quite as interesting. The panel I'm going to make today is only going to be about two feet wide, although obviously you can make a table as wide and large as you'd like. But this will probably be used more for end table, and it's going to be approximately two feet. So looking at this, I want to take advantage of this curve that's here, and a little bit narrower section here. I'll probably start the table right about here, although it's hard to see, this is the heartwood in this section and that gives me some nice variation on the edge. Going approximately two feet brings me to about here. That'll be the table. I'm gonna go ahead and cut it an extra couple inches on each side. That'll give us a room to make sure when we plane it, we uh, are able to cut away the snipe and also a little extra space in case I need to a little bit of extra space when squaring up the edge, which you'll see later. So I'm going to go ahead and make my cuts here and along this section there. The next step will be to plane the board down. Problem is it has a little bit of a twist in it. It, it wobbles on the table. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and first cut it in half then it'll have less twist in it, which will be there for me to remove. And it'll be easier for me to run this through the jointer first, being narrower pieces, and then through the planer. So I'm going to go ahead and pick where I want to go ahead and slice it. And just looking through it, I want it approximately in the middle here. And approximately in the middle just before it narrows up too much. Probably right about here. So... I'm going to go ahead, put a nice straight line through here, and then I'll go ahead and use a jig that I've got for the table saw that allows me to cut rough edged pieces. After these pieces have been cut, you'll get an idea of how they'll fit together to create what's going to look like a riverbank edge. I'm going to go ahead, uh, flatten out both sides on the joiner and planer, and when I'm done I'm going to talk to you about how we handle the bark. The best way to take it off is whatever works for you. I, you sometimes you get lucky and big chunks will just pop right off. If they don't, you can lose them with the hammer, your screwdriver, pry bar, chisel, whatever works for you. Alright, I sanded the edges down, down to 220 grit. I purposely left a lot of the coloration on there in order to uh, give it a little more visual appeal. But I did have to make sure I got rid of all the bark and the uh, Camden layer that was below it. I don't really need to sand down any more than that because all of that's going to be completely covered with resin. The goal is to just make a nice, smooth, visually appealing surface where there also won't be any room for air bubbles to form. The next step is to go ahead and cut 90 degrees to this edge over here. Go ahead and pick where I want it. I've got a square. I'm going to go ahead and cut one side first. Once I'm comfortable with where it looks on both of the pieces, I'll cut both of them to exactly the same length, and then we'll go ahead and fit it into the form.
The next step is to go ahead and prepare the mold. I've already cut the pieces so that way when they fit in there it'll work out rather well. I have side pieces, these are melamine as well, that will go right up to the, both of the edges. And these two end pieces, one is going to go ahead and slide right up to the edge to line up nicely. Once I've got everything lined up and the board's in place, I'll take the last one and I will secure it nice and tight up against the other edge of the board. But the first step I need to do is to wrap all the pieces in Tyvek. Tyvek is used for uh, typically for sheathing that goes around the outside of the house and stuff doesn't tend to stick to it. For that reason you don't actually have to use melamine, but I like to use it because it's nice and flat, easy to work with, no grains to uh, get in the way, and the Tyvek sticks to it rather well. Now that all the surfaces that are going to come in contact with the epoxy have been covered with Tyvek, it's time to put the whole form together. It's going to be pretty simple. I'm going to go ahead and first mount the two sides and one end all the way on one edge. After I'm done doing that, I'll fit everything else to get the last piece in place. First thing I'm going to do is go ahead and screw the two sides to the end piece. Then I'm going to go ahead from the bottom and screw all of that to the main base. All along the way I'm going to put a very very thin uh, line of silicone between all the joints. I don't want much because I don't want it to bulk it up but I want enough to make sure that nothing seeps through as the epoxy is poured. I'll go ahead and I'll do that now. I am going to pre-drill all the holes to make sure that I don't end up splitting um, any of the form or causing it to bulge out which could change the shape of the final pour. If you're wondering why I use so many screws, is because that makes sure it pulls everything in tight around the entire perimeter, really minimizing the risk of having any leaks. So between having perfectly flat surfaces, a little silicone, tightly screwed down, I don't think we're going to have any issues here. Okay, wiped off any excess silicone that might have squeezed into the surface here. Now that I've wiped that out, it's time to get the very last piece fit into the form. This is going to be form fit right to the wood. So I'm going to go ahead, place the panels in place. And now that they're here in the form, I can take the last piece, figure out where it needs to go in. I'm going to go ahead and mark that on the form itself. Now I can pre-drill the holes, get the side screwed in, and then I'll get the rest of it from the bottom. We need to figure out how much epoxy we need to pour in order to fill up this void. To do that's fairly simple. We're going to calculate cubic inches and then convert it to ounces. So 
Measuring this out, it is about 22 and a half inches. And looking at the different distances here, we'll say it's an average of about six and a half inches across, and the wood's three quarters of an inch thick. So, figuring that out, 22.5 times 6.5 wide times 0.75 tall, that comes out to approximately 110 cubic inches. We're going to go ahead and divide that by two because we're going to do this in two different pores, which leaves us with 55 inches cubed. If you go to Google and type in 55 cubic inches to ounces, it comes back and tells you that it equals just a little more than 33 fluid ounces. That's really easy for us to work with and we'll be able to go ahead and figure out how much to mix now to go ahead and create our table. It's extremely important that this entire form is perfectly level in all directions. So I've already pre-cut some shims and I've been checking the level and I've discovered that I do need to go ahead and put a few in a couple different places and once I've done that I've noticed that everything looks really good all the way around. Before we go and pour a lot of epoxy into this table we're going to go ahead and seal the wood where it's just on the edge so that way later on when we do a larger pour we end up with um, really no chance of bubbles coming out or issues as the epoxy tries to soak into the wood at that point. So you don't need much. I'm just going to go ahead and mix up a little bit of this. I'm using a Total Boat High Performance Epoxy and I'm using a slow hardener. The slow hardener is really good for tables like this for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is of course it gives you more time to work with the epoxy as you're mixing it and preparing colors and the rest. The other is that as you pour it, epoxy heats up and if you use a faster hardener there's a chance that with a thicker pour you could end up overheating the epoxy causing it to fail on you. It can crack, it can bubble, it could uh, warp your frame by being too hot. Right now I'm just going to go ahead and mix up this little bit. What I like to do is after I mix it is I'm going to let it sit for just a couple of minutes to allow the bubbles that are in here from the mixing work themselves out and then we'll go ahead and brush it onto the edges of the wood. I'm using a disposable brush in order to go ahead and put this on because whatever brush you use is going to get ruined. And all I'm doing is painting it on almost like you would be putting on a thick finish. This will go ahead, seal the edge of the wood. You don't really need to get on the top because that's all going to get sanded off later once the table is done anyway. The seal coat of epoxy has hardened up. If it's hard but a little bit tacky, then you'd be in excellent shape to go ahead and pour the first layer down. If it's completely hardened up, like if you let it harden overnight, then you can get something like a fine grit uh, sanding pad and lightly scuff the edges. You'll need to do that to make sure the next layer adheres to the uh, epoxy that's already cured on the wood. Of course you don't want to pour thick coats of epoxy all at once because it could overheat. We're going to do this in two pours and we figured out earlier that we're going to need about 33 ounces of epoxy per pour. So I'm going to go ahead, mix this up and uh, we'll go ahead and get ready to go ahead and give the first pour. I've stirred this for about two to three minutes. I'm going to go ahead and add some pigment to it now. I'm using stuff called Black Diamond, which is a almost metallic-like uh, pigment. It has a great shimmer to it. Let's see how it turns out. As you can see, 
This has a great shimmer to it. Should look terrific when I pour it into the mold. I like to add it from one end going to the other, raising it up some and pouring in a bit of a stream. So that way, while it streams out, it ends up breaking up some of the bubbles that are still left inside the surface. Most of the bubbles, if not all, should work themselves all the way up to the very top. It's important after mixing this to make sure that you get it in fairly quickly because while the epoxy is sitting inside the pot in a large volume, it could heat up rather rapidly and preset on you. I'm going to go ahead and just add a, a bit of a waviness to it to add a little extra visual interest. Kind of give the impression of water flowing through a river. I've let this sit for a few minutes and bubbles are now rising up to the surface. They may not all pop on their own, so in order to get rid of them before we go ahead and get ready to pour the second layer in after it hardens, you're able to quickly just take a blowtorch and really fast and rapidly pop the bubbles with the heat. You don't want to heat up the epoxy, the goal is to just pop the bubbles. The second layer can be poured once the surface is um, solidified a bit and it's still a little tacky. If you wait for it to completely harden, you'll have to scuff the surface before pouring the next layer. Well, I didn't get a chance to get the second pour on this before it fully hardened. So I went ahead and scuffed up the entire surface with the fine sanding pad. Now this is done, going to go ahead and repeat it. Going to mix some epoxy, put some dye in there. I'll be stirring it up for a couple of minutes and pouring it into place. The epoxy is cured overnight and this looks just amazing. You can see it's got amazing coloration to it. It's nice and solid. We're going to go ahead and take the mold off now. I'm going to be unscrewing everything. I might need a little bit of finesse in order to try to get this to pop out. And then next step will be sanding it down. I'm fortunate enough to have a drum sander which I'm going to use to go ahead and flatten both sides of the panel. Some people can go ahead and use a planer if they have one wide enough. However, I exercise caution when doing that because you could get a uh, chip out or cracking of the resin when you do it. So make sure you use extremely light passes. Other options include um, router sleds, belt sanders, random orbit sanders, uh, CNC if you have one that uh, set for flattening. You can do almost anything you want to go ahead and get it flattened out. Just make sure you start with a coarse grit and then eventually work yourself down to um, the finer and finer grits. I'm going to start with the belt sander with a coarse grit in there. I have got happen to have 80 in the machine. I'll be taking quite a few passes to flatten it out. Once it's done, I'm going to go to my random orbit sander to go ahead and uh, sand it down to the final sanded finish.
Now that the panel is flat, I'm going to go ahead and clean up the edges on my table saw before I go ahead and do a final sanding. To sand this smooth, I'm going to use my random orbit sander. I'm going to start with 80 grit and then work myself down to 320. Once I do that, I'll see how it all looks. And I'm going to uh, move on to micro mesh and go through those grits probably down to about a four. That'll give it a very smooth surface. It won't be glass smooth. We'll end up with a really perfect finish later once we apply a coat of polyurethane on top of this. Using a random orbit sander, I brought this down to 320 grit and then about two more layers down with micro mesh. Some might even consider that to be too much because you need to have some texture on top of the resin in order to make sure the polyurethane sticks to it. I'm going to use about a 60% poly, 40% mineral spirits to go ahead and brush on the bottom right now. I'll put two or three coats in the bottom first, then I'll flip it over after all that cures and I'll work on the other side as well as the sides. I have a light set up right here. This light shines across the surface and makes it really easy for me to look at the glare and check and make sure that I've got a good smooth finish and that nothing is missing. It's time to see both the walnut and the resin really pop. Once this polyurethane makes it onto the resin, it'll suddenly become very transparent compared to the way it looks right now. Nice thing is, when working with resin, it's possible to sand it and polish it all the way down to a glass smooth finish, which is what a lot of people may do when they're working with only resin. But when you're doing this with wood as well, you really can't practically do that because you need to put a finish on the wood. So, as you can see, all the beautiful translucency and the bit of the swirl and the patterns that formed from that special metallic-ish uh, pigments that we used cause everything to pop inside the resin as we go ahead and put the finish on it. Here it is, after several coats of polyurethane were put on both sides. It's now ready to go ahead and be mounted on legs or even put up on the wall like a work of art. This particular piece I created with no special tools or materials with the exception of the epoxy resin and the dye which is easy enough to go ahead and find online. Also, you should know that I have a confession to make. I created this piece as the very first river table I'd ever created. If I can create this on the first try, it means you can obviously also. I highly encourage you to try this and other uses with the epoxy. You'd be surprised how much you can do with it once you go ahead and start playing with it.